Hi, welcome to our OneSpatial HPMS webinar. My name is Luke Winters and I'm a solution engineer here at OneSpatial. Today we'll be taking a look at what's coming in HPMS 9.0 and how OneSpatial and our technology are helping DOTs across the country with their HPMS submissions as well as their overall data quality. First, I'd like to set the stage with a quick bit of background for HPMS version 9.0 and OneSpatial's involvement, as well as their experience with transportation and linear referencing more generally. To start off, prior HPMS versions were generally adequate, but they were built on Silverlight, which is a problem since Silverlight's end of life was scheduled for October 2021. Because of this, a whole system rebuild was required. And while that rebuild is necessary, why not also improve the process at the same time? Prior versions of HPMS relied on manual processing, Python scripts to kick off validations, and only checked the LRS, not the underlying geometry of the road networks. All of this led to bottlenecking, where states could not submit and be validated concurrently. With that context in mind, for version 9.0, the goals are, first, of course, to move off the Silverlight, but also to simplify the processing of each state's submission, allowing for more automation and parallel processing, and add in not just LRS validations, but also validate the geometry of the road networks. So how does one spatial fit into this? Well, for the data quality and coverage validation portions of the upcoming 9.0 release, Federal Highways is leveraging one spatial technology, specifically our flagship technology called One Integrate, to achieve these goals of HPMS 9.0. We've been working with Federal Highways for almost three years, including this 9.0 update. And what is it that One Integrate enables for HPMS? Like I mentioned on the prior slide, older versions of HPMS used Python scripts for validation. And although this was adequate for what they were trying to accomplish, there were some issues. For starters, any time there was a change in legislation or policy, it required developer time to interpret and script the changes. And one of the benefits of moving to one integrate is that authoring these rules can be done by subject matter experts instead of developers. And this is because of one integrates no code but configurable approach to creating rules. Changing to one integrate has also allowed Federal Highways to add more specific and complex checks, utilizing geometry and topology for coverage and geometric validations. And finally, not only is the rules engine more performant on a per state basis, but we're also able to process in parallel by spinning up multiple instances of the rules engine, all referencing back to the same rules, so states can be validated concurrently. Let's go into what this means for states and their HPMS submission process. With this partnership with the Federal Highways Administration, we're in a unique position to help state DOTs with their HPMS submission process. We're currently working with several states, including Massachusetts, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania on their processes. Leveraging One Integrate has a few real benefits for HPMS at the state level. The most clear benefit is that you can use the exact rules and validations that the Federal Highways is using. And of course, that gives you the ability to see the results just as Federal Highways will see them, so you can make any changes necessary prior to the submission process. And again, since you have the exact validations, that eliminates the need to interpret the HPMS field manual or hire contractors to interpret it for you. And lastly is a change in process. You can make data quality into a continuous process instead of just at the HPMS submission. You can validate changes when you're taking in data from different sources, while you're editing, or validate your whole data set at ongoing intervals. And one of the biggest benefits for states is that the HPMS rules are being maintained by federal highways. States using one integrate for HPMS are provided these exact updates, so you don't have to manually update the rules or script anything. Just run our sync tool with the updated rules from federal highways and you'll have the latest versions. Before we get into the specifics of how one spatial works with federal highways, I'd like to take a minute to talk about who One Spatial is as a company and some of our other clients we work with in the transportation space. One Spatial Inc. is a US-based company headquartered just outside of Washington, DC, and we're wholly owned by One Spatial Group out of the UK. One Spatial in the UK has been around for about 50 years, but we're newer here in the US. We started with our first customer as US Census, validating their Tiger files. And since then, we've been expanding our customers using our technology to validate data in several sectors, including government, utilities, and transportation. We have experience with network and LRS data workflows, including utilities, DOTs, and emergency services. We 
We also work with non-spatial data, such as our work in validating CAD or computer-aided design data with Google's real estate and workplace services. All of our customers have one thing in common, and that's data. Even though we have spatial in our name, we're really data agnostic. We can work with just about any format, spatial or non-spatial. So things like asset management systems, GIS, and CAD can all be validated within our technology. And at OneSpatial, we focus on three aspects of data quality, which allow for what we call the spatial advantage. These, as you can see on your screen now, are data validation, integration, and enhancement. Data validation is all about knowing where your data stands. What's the quality level? We use a rules-based approach to automate the quality assurance and control of spatial and non-spatial data. And this reduces the time and subjectivity necessary for a normal QA, QC process. Data integration is, in, is achieved by taking siloed data sets and validating them against each other. This goes hand in hand with data enhancement, where we automate the editing, shifting, or inference of data. One important note on data enhancement is that we know a lot of our customers want to maintain control over the edits that are made to their data. So we can also create these changes as proposals instead of automatic changes. So you can retain that human review, but in a much more efficient way. Next, I'd like to go back into HPMS and talk about what's different in version 9.0 and with how LRS checks differ from geometric and topological validations. So taking this slide, starting here with a sample LRS table. If you're just checking the LRS, there's no geometry involved. And you have to check each range individually to make sure each required data item is present and correct. This means you have a lot of transactions, especially depending on how finely segmented your LRS is. In contrast, if we use topology, there's a few pre-processing steps, and then it's much more efficient. So first, we have to create geometry. And to do that, we take the Arnold route, and for each datum item in the sections table on that route, we segment the line and create a new object of that data item with the geometry. Taking this example, we have five rows in the section table for route 100. For k factor, we segment the line into two pieces, with the first having a data value of 11, and the second following right after with a data value of 18. We do this same thing for AADT, but there's three sections in this table. We create those new lines. And this is done for each data item on that route. And there's many more than that are shown here. After the sections have been created into geometries, we can build topology. Essentially, we split the Arnold any time there's a change in segmentation. This allows us to check each of those edges for conformance with the HPMS coverage validations. And we'll talk about some of these checks in a bit, but that's sort of the background of how HPMS validations will look in 9.0 using geometry and topology rather than LRS. So the first step in the workflow is creating geometries of that from the Arnold data using the sections or data items. Using this example, you can see that the ADT items in the LRS and the geometry of the roads on the bottom. We use these measure values to segment the roads so we can compare all the coverage. We also allow for schema mapping if necessary, and we know that source schema from DOTs aren't always exactly the same as the HPMS schema. So we create some actions to map those data items with the correct format while keeping your source schema intact. After we have the schemas correct and the routes segmented, we can move on to the rules. The first set are domain checks. In this example, we're looking at checking that the AADT value is greater than zero and is truncated, so no decimals. For any section with an AADT value outside of those parameters, we can write that out as a nonconformance and drop a point or a line on the map at that location, as we can see on the right. We have that selected and we can see that the AADT value is null, and that's why it's coming up as a nonconformance. On the bottom of the slide, you can see a selection of the domains that we check. In total, there's about 70 of these attribute domain validations. The bulk of the validation are geometric and coverage checks. Before getting into the coverage issues, we run, run what we call our essential geometry checks. And these rules look for common issues in geometric data, such as spikes or kickbacks, which are typically caused from errant vertices during editing. We also look for overlaps, self-intersections, and duplicate features. 
We then build topology on the data. And this makes those feature-to-feature -feature transactions really performant once that topology is in place. And we can add a lot more validations without a large performance hit. We get to then the coverage checks themselves. And here we have about 65 validations, making sure that certain data items are present on each section of the road, depending on the other variables present on that route. Any section that's missing a required data item is marked up with a line on that section. So for example, a route section with a facility type of 1, 2, 4, or 6 must have an AADT value data item present. Anywhere that a route has one of those facility types but does not have any ADT data item present, we output a markup on the location of the issue to drive users for editing. So now that we've got the base workflow covered, I'd like to go ahead and show how this works live, and we'll use Rhode Island as an example. Next, I'd like to take a look at some data and show how the HPMS validation process works and one integrate. For today, I'll be using Rhode Island as an example, and you can see that I have the data loaded into a map in ArcGIS Pro. However, it's important to note you don't need a specific GIS to use OneIntegrate and the HPMS package. I'm just using ArcGIS Pro today for visualization purposes. Currently, I have the Arnold Road Network turned on, and I also have the sections table available down here. These are the two data sets that are used to create the geometries on each data item in the network in OneIntegrate. Those are then used to pass through into the validation portion where we're checking the domains and the coverages, which we'll show now. So let's go ahead into one integrate and we'll show you around what this process looks like. So this one integrate here, it's a server-based application uh, and, and you open up the interface in whatever web browser you prefer. Right now we're in what's called the sessions tab. We'll come back here in just a minute, but first I want to go ahead into the other tabs just to get you a little acquainted. Starting over here on the left with the data stores, this is where we can configure data coming in and out. If we look at the input details for this, we can see that we're bringing in a geodatabase, but we can bring in all sorts of data, spatial and non-spatial. Of course, we can bring in you know, geodatabases, shapefiles, Azure feature services, and so on. But then for non-spatial, we have all sorts of other options like CSVs, uh, Oracle databases, even CAD drawings. We can uh, change the schema if we need to. So if we have a um, slightly different schema than the, than the base HPMS uh, schema. We can map the classes and attributes here. We can then also configure what we're going to download. So we, in this case, we have it set up to still download the same sort of geodatabase, but we can change that if we need to. And we can also map our output so we can either keep our original schema or uh, change it to a different one if we need to. Our rules tab is next, and this is where we can configure our business rules. And we'll come back here and look at a few in particular in a bit. Our actions are where we make either edits to the data or we can create markup to show where issues are. And the action maps are where we can link to a specific rule to a specific action. So if a feature fails a rule or is a non-conformance, then that action will be triggered for only that feature. And then we go back into our sessions here. I'm going to go ahead and kick this off, and then we can go ahead and talk about what the session is and what each of these steps are. So a session is really just a, uh, a workflow that's been configured, and a bunch of different tasks or steps are in here. Each of these different items is a task. We have things like opening data, checking rules, building topology, um, creating uh, edits through actions, and downloading our data with copying out to whatever format we have. So the first step here is our open data tasks. And the, what's happening here is that the data is being loaded into OneIntegrate and into the cache. And a neat thing about OneIntegrate is that it runs under the hood on what's called an object-oriented disk cache. And this allows us to uh, index all of the geometries and the specified attributes for our data. And what's really neat about it is it's done on the disk and not on memory. That way we can scale really well. We don't end up filling up the RAM very, uh, filling up the RAM and slowing our process down. Everything is stored in indexed in the disk. So we have three data sets that are being brought in right now. First is our markup data, which is just an empty schema that we'll write out to. We then have our HPMS sample, and that's what 
Those are all the different geometries for the different data items on the network. That are, those have been created in a, in a separate session. And then we have our Arnold data um, for reference as well. After that, we start getting into our rules. The first set are what we call our essential geometry checks. And these are rules that we give out to all of our customers and they look for common issues and geometric features. Things like duplicate features and vertices, uh, kickbacks, spikes, overlaps, and multi-part geometries, and so on. A lot of these are common errors that you get when you're digitizing or editing data. And we can see what our conformance levels are for our Arnold roads here. So for each of these, we have a conformance level. So for example, for duplicate features, we have 99.5% are conforming. That means that most of our features are not duplicate. And we can look in here to see sort of how many exactly there are. And we see that of the 1,600 features, we have eight that are not conforming. Now, this is really good to get an overview of your data. But the other thing we can do with these is that we can write out those markups. And we'll put a line or a point on each of these features where one of these issues are. And we'll take a look at that after the session is completed. We'll go ahead and look at our output data in ArcGIS Pro again. After our uh, essential geometry checks, the next step is building topology. And like I mentioned in the PowerPoint, once, the, once we've built topology once, it allows for really quick comparisons going forward. This is the longest step in the session, but again, once it's built, we'll be able to do very quick checks for all the coverage checks. Now that that's completed, the next step are our attribute checks. We have about 70 total domain checks. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, start these and we can take a look at how some of these work. So these will start off really quickly um, and we can scroll down and see our different conformance levels for the different uh, domains. And we're seeing that we're done with the domains and we're already onto the coverage checks. While these start to run, I'd like to go ahead back into the rules and, and look at how some of these are built. An important note uh, is for our HPMS Jumpstart package for states. The rules are provided and maintained by Federal Highways. So editing and authoring these rules is not necessary for HPMS, but if you wanted to create other validations for different processes that you may have, this is how you would do that. So um, looking at this first domain, we're looking at the curves A domain, and we've written a description saying that the value numeric must be greater than zero. So this is a really simple check. And if we go into our rule condition, we can see how this is configured. We're looking at our curves A again, and we're just seeing that the value numeric is greater than zero. So really simple. Um, we can make these uh, more complex if we need to as well. Let's look at just a couple of more. The F system domain, we'll go back to general here. F system domain, um, read our description, and we'll see that we're looking for a whole number in the range of one to seven. And the way we do that is by using this floor function, and we're seeing basically that that's just truncated. So we're saying that the uh, the value is, you know, has no decimal points. And then this, we're saying that it's in the range of one to seven. Makes sense. Now, if we take a look at one more of these, this one will look, look a lot more complicated, but it's really the same thing as this F system domain. We're again looking that the value is truncated and then it can be any one of these ranges. So we're saying that it's either in the range of one to four, 11 or 12, 21, 25 to 27, and so on. So we can keep adding these ranges for whatever the valid values are for our uh, for these rules. And again, if you don't want to create your own business rules, you don't need to for HPMS um, as they're being maintained by Federal Highways and they're available to you if you're using one in a grade for HPMS. Um, but if you do want to get under the hood and create your own rules for other uses, the rules engine is very configurable, and we do offer support and training if you want to get your hands into the software some more. Let's go back to the session and take a look at the next steps that are being run here. After our domain checks, we're looking at coverage checks. And, and we're essentially looking at all the different data items which have been dynamically segmented and created those geometries and making sure that they exist where they're needed. Some of the data items are only necessary based on other attributes, so we have conditions configured to check for those existences where they're necessary. There are really two types of coverage checks we have. The first is full coverage, meaning that routes must have certain features. 
The first one of these is the sys edge coverage. Let's go ahead and look at this again in the rule builder. So the sys edge is our topology class. So every line becomes an edge once we create topology. Anywhere that there's a section, we must have a facility type, an ownership, and a route number data item on that line. We could add more if we needed to as well here. The Arnold coverage is our second uh, full coverage check. And uh, for every sys edge that also has an Arnold item here, we need that facility type and ownership, but we also need to add in an urban code and an F system. If any of those are missing, it will be considered a non-conforming feature, and we'll write out a markup on that location just for the portion of the line that one of those is not there. After the full coverage checks, we then get into context-based coverage validations. These data items are only required when certain other data items are not present, are present on the edge. One example of these is toll charged. We can go ahead and take a look at this. So this makes sense, right? For, for lines that have a toll type on them, there must be a toll charged item as well. So um, that's sort of those, com uh, those context-based ones. And this can get more complex, of course. We can have um, uh, conditions only when there are several data in present, we must have another. But those are, we have about 70 of those in total. So let's go back to the session and we'll see our last uh, set of validations after our coverage checks here. And the last section are cross validations, sample and length checks. And these are basically any other rules which aren't strictly domains or coverages. And these include making sure that values of the cracking percentage are the correct, in the correct range um, based on the surface type and validating that individual data items aren't too long geometrically. We're currently implementing other rules beyond the se uh, sections data for the release of HPMS 9.0. The, ca uh, the categories are on your screen now. So this rule catalog will continue to grow and evolve, and states using when integrate for HPMS will receive these updates as they come out from Federal Highways. After the rules are completed, we can download the results and view in any GIS. And so for now, we'll go back into ArcGIS Pro again, and we'll take a look at some of these results. Now that the session is complete, I wrote out the results to view here in ArcGIS Pro again. Each of the essential geometry check nonconformances are written out either as a line here, or in the case of self-intersections, are written out as a point. We also have inventory violations written out, but we're going to start out by, start by looking at the essential geometry checks. Starting with self-intersections, we have this point on the map that's been written out again by, by one integrate. And if we select this Arnold route, we can see that it doubles back on itself at that point. Being a self-intersections, so that's where one integrate has dropped that point on the map, so that we can drive users to find the actual problem areas. Turning on our markup lines now, and we'll take a look at a few, few other checks. First one is a duplicate feature check, and we can see here uh, that that should be in green. So right here in the center, we have this uh, line that would show that we have two Arnold routes with the same geometry, and we do here. Similarly, we're looking at an overlapping Arnold, and those are marked up in red. So if I select this route, we have this coming up and curving around, but that curve is also shared by this Arnold, so we've marked those up as an overlapping feature. Moving along to some coverage checks now, I'll we'll turn off our central geometry check markups and I'll look at F system first. F system is one of those um, universal coverage checks. Every route that's submitted should have an F system present on it. So anywhere that doesn't would be a nonconformance. So for now, I have put F system in this brown color, and the underlying black again is that um, is that Arnold route. So in this case, it's pretty easy to see where those nonconformances are, anywhere that there's not a F system. So we've marked those up in red. Similarly, we have um, route number is another uh, full coverage check that we should have on every route. So again, I've written those out in brown this time again. And again, we have this uh, route that's in black that does not have it. So we have marked that up as a nonconformance as well. A little more tricky is something like ADT, which is one of those contextual coverage checks. Take a look here. And just by looking at this, we don't know that these black lines are necessarily 
um, nonconformances because AEDT is not needed all the time. It's needed if there's an, a facility type of 1, 2, 4, or an F system of 1 through 5, or an F system of 6 with an urban code, or an NHA, NHS object. In those cases, there needs to be an AEDT item. Um, so that's been configured in one integrate, and anywhere that there are one of those objects, but not an F system, we've written out this red line saying that those are the problem areas for this rule. And so each of these rules can be configured in one integrate to have their nonconformances written out just like these, allowing you to easily find the issues in your data prior to each EHPMS submission to make the process a lot smoother. So with that, I'd like to thank you for attending our webinar. As the first HPMS 9.0 submission approaches, we're eager to help you prepare, and we have our HPMS Jumpstart package ready with the exact rules from Federal Highways and are working with several states to streamline their submission process. We hope to work with you and your source system and data in your environment to pre-validate your HPMS submission. If you have any questions or would like to talk further about implementing one spatial technology, please reach out. We'd be happy to answer any questions or set up a, set up a time to follow up more in depth. Thank you.